Good morning, church. Welcome to Burnaby Christian Pentecostal Church Online. Today, we are continuing our series on moving forward, and we're in part six, and I've entitled this lesson, Bloom in Babylon. We're going to take a look at the character of Daniel in the Bible. Daniel, of course, one of the great prophets in the Old Testament, and he was an interesting character and a tremendous example for you and I, because Daniel was one that was caught up in a negative situation that really had nothing to do with his own character. He was a victim, if you will, to war. And we're going to take a look at what happened here in the book of Daniel, chapter 1. And we're going to read this entire chapter. It's not very long, but let's see what took place in uh, the times of the nation of Israel. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men to whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave the names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, and here's three you might recognize, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So now get a picture of what's happening here. The nation of Israel again had turned their back on God. And so he allowed them to be conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar at Babylon. He allowed them to be conquered because they no longer wanted to serve the Lord. So they rejected his blessing. They rejected his protection. They rejected his ways. And so God allowed them to be conquered by an enemy nation, the Babylonians. You might know that today, modern day Babylon is now Iraq. And so back in these days, Nebuchadnezzar was reigning as king, and they besieged Jerusalem in 605 BC. So as was customary in uh, conquering nations, they would often get the cream of the crop. They would haul off young men that would serve in different ways in their new country. And so Nebuchadnezzar basically gave the command to find select men, good-looking smart, affluent young men who could be reprogrammed. They were hoping to re-indoctrinate these young men. So for three years, they were sent into the school of the Babylonians, learning their Chaldean ways, their literature, their culture, their pagan ideology. They were retrained and they had to learn the language, learn the customs. And so they were basically being schooled to be able to serve in the king's court. Three years of indoctrination. Yeah, look what happened here in the second part of this chapter. It says in verse 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You see, uh, Jewish custom and laws had certain uh, dietary restrictions. God allowed them to eat cows, and there was certain policies about cloven hoof animals, but they were not allowed to eat pork or meat that had been offered to idols. They had certain laws that God had commissioned for them in order to keep them pure and undefiled. And so, yes, they could eat some meat, but only certain kinds of meat. And here the king was offering these different types of meats that would have defiled their Jewish Hebrew laws. And so Daniel requested that they would not defile themselves. Look at verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. He had earned his favor. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your food and drink. 
Why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are of your age? And by the way, he would have been probably a teenager when he got hauled into captivity. Uh, Bible scholars believe maybe around 15 years of age, a young man, not even a, a full adult yet, just a young man probably in his mid to late teens. So then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. So likely three years had passed, the schooling was done, and now it was time to be tested. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served them before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued into the first year of King Cyrus, ten times better than all the rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that even when we go through trials and tribulations, you are with us. You never leave or forsake us. We pray as we examine the life of Daniel and his friends that we would learn from their character, learn from their resolve. Lord, that we can bloom where we're planted, even in what might seem to be like Babylon in today's world. Jesus, you are alive and well. Your church is alive and well, and you are building your church. Forgive us, we pray, dear Lord, for all of our mistakes. Cleanse us from all sin. We pray that you would fill us up now fresh and new with a fresh touch of your Holy Spirit and that you would speak to our hearts, help us to learn and grow and become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. So this awesome passage of scripture has some really key lessons for us. Number one I want to say is this. Remember who you are, children of God. Remember who you are. I like what it says in 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, when we invite the Lord to be our Lord, we invite Jesus to come in and be the leader of our life, the Lord of our life, we become a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. And now we are a part of his family. We are children of God. Isn't that awesome? And he called us a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We're set apart for service, to serve the Lord God. And this is just like Daniel was. He knew that he was set apart to serve the Lord. And he wasn't going to compromise his faith. So when the Babylonian army invaded Jerusalem, they would haul off these young choice men and they endeavored to indoctrinate them. They would actually change their names. They were hoping that they would forget who they were and that they would embrace this new ideology, their new culture. And so, for instance, uh, Daniel's name in Hebrew is God is my judge. The Lord is my judge. And they changed his name to Belteshazzar, which means Prince of Bel. And Bel was one of the pagan deities that they would serve in uh, Babylonian culture. And so you could see what was trying to take place here, what the Babylonians hoped to do. And yet I love the fact that Daniel never forgot who he was. They might transplant him from his home in uh, Judah and take him here to the land of Babylon in a foreign country with all kinds of weird ways. And yet the reality is he knew that he was a child of God, that he was serving the Lord, Yahweh. And so the reality is Daniel 
stood his ground, that he remembered who he was. I don't know if you've ever had a tendency to forget something that was important to you. I remember when I was just a kid growing up in Bellingham, Washington, we would ride our bikes up and down this street and it was our street that we lived on and the reality is though it wasn't really well maintained. There were some pretty good homes along the street but the street itself developed these huge potholes and it was sometimes it would take the city a while to go and fill the potholes. And so we had our little Schwinn Stingray style bikes with the funky handlebars and the banana seats. Again, this was the 70s. And we would ride these things up and down the street. And I had an older brother, Greg, and still do today, and a younger brother, Paul. But Paul was just a, a little guy, but Greg and I would ride our bikes. We were old enough where we knew how to ride. And so uh, one day I hit a pothole so bad that apparently I must have flipped my bike because I remember basically waking up and going into the washroom, going to the bathroom, and I had all these bandages on my face. And it was because of a bike accident, as I recall. And yet I didn't recall hitting the pothole. I didn't recall flipping my bike. But all of a sudden, I walk into this washroom and I'm all bandaged up from these cuts and scrapes that I had received through this accident. And it was a weird sensation that I just didn't have the memory of that. So it might have caused maybe a little bit of Dane Bramage. Who knows? The reality is that sometimes we can forget things that are important to us. But as Christians, we never want to forget who we are. We are bought with a price that Jesus paid on Calvary's cross. We are set apart for service. Sanctification means being set apart. Now we're not living for ourselves. We're living for God. We're living for Jesus Christ each and every day. And he guides and directs us by his Holy Spirit. And he leads us through his word. We have a mission. We have a mandate to go and make disciples of all creation, of all nations. And so we are serving the Lord. We never want to forget that, that our identity is no longer in ourselves. Our identity is in Christ. We have a high calling and we have a higher purpose to live for. And I love the fact that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they purposed in their hearts to remain loyal to the Lord. They purposed in their heart. This took decision. This took an intentional act. This took resolve, determination. They were determined that they weren't going to compromise their faith, but they're going to live faithful to the Lord God. And isn't that what he's calling us to do today? Number two this morning. Remember to honor those in authority represent Jesus well. Now in our current world, in our current situation, going through a global pandemic, there's a lot of frustration at times with those in authority over us. And sometimes our natural inclination is to maybe try and rebel. Your inclination might be to push back. And certainly we keep our leaders held in accountability, especially our elected officials. They're elected for the people and by the people. They're elected to serve us. And there can be a tendency sometimes for uh, that to get lost in translation. But the reality is, as Christians, we're called to honor those in authority over us, to honor those and to, to obey our local and uh, regional and even our federal authorities. Yes, we are called to obey those that God has placed over us. This is what the Bible tells us in Romans 13.1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. In other words, the Lord is the one who allowed the people that are placed in authority over us to be in power, to have their position. And we will represent Jesus well when we're willing to uh, respect and pray for and honor our authorities. Now, I know sometimes it might be hard to respect when there is decisions that are made, when there are policies that are made that uh, we know are wrong, that go against our conscience, that go against what the Word of God says. So we don't always necessarily respect what they do, but we need to respect the office of those people. And we need to do our best to live in obedience, to live in harmony, to honor those that the Lord has placed in authority over us. That's what the Bible tells us to do. Ultimately, we obey God first. We know that. Like Peter and John and, 
Acts chapter 4, when the Jewish leaders tried to try to pressure them to stop sharing about Jesus. And they said, is it better to obey God than man? You be the judge. But we can't stop but sharing our faith because that's something that the Lord had commanded them to do. So, you know, we know that ultimately God is the one that we obey first and foremost. But the Lord does tell us, instruct us to obey those that he has placed in authority over us. Let's lead by example. Let's lead as good citizens. Let's shine bright. And you know what? When you take a look at the life of Daniel, he had some choices to make. He could have been real obnoxious and pushed back and said, no way, we're not going to eat this, and maybe try to lead a revolt against uh, the eunuchs that were placed in charge. And the eunuchs, they were people that had been basically uh, altered physically to serve the king, and there would be then no threat of any kind of interplay with the concubines or the wives. And so they had their own cross to bear. They had their own place, their own service within the king's court that they were called to do. And so um, Daniel and his compadres, they could have done things differently. But what did they do? He went to the chief eunuch and he requested that they be given this special disposition, this special uh, allowance to not eat these certain meats that would violate their Hebrew culture but that they will be allowed to eat vegetables, basically a vegetarian diet. Now, the Bible here is not mandating that everybody be a vegetarian. In fact, just what it says is that God provided where they should have actually been a little bit leaner and they didn't have as much protein, and yet God allowed them to, to sustain and to be strong and healthy and vital. So they looked even better than those who had all the protein that they wanted. And so isn't that neat how God provided for them? Now, there is something to be said about a healthy diet. Make sure you get your fruit and vegetables. But the Lord allowed the Hebrews to eat meat. Just had to be certain types of meat, kosher meat. Meat that was uh, sanctified. Meat that was allowed through Hebrew law. Number three, remember to trust and obey the Lord. He will use you greatly. You see, this was difficult for Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to, to be able to follow through. And there's going to be another situation later where they were called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's idol. You might recall that story. And they were thrown into the fiery furnace. But God protected them and delivered them from that situation. So after 10 days of only vegetables for food, Daniel and his friends were healthier than all the rest. So God proved that those who serve the Lord are going to be in a better position, have more wisdom, have more strength, have more uh, insight and understanding than those who embrace the world's ideology. God's ways are the best ways. His ways are higher than ours. And wisdom begins as we fear the Lord and learn his word, and then apply his word. So God gave Daniel and his friends wisdom and understanding 10 times greater. They earned great favor. Uh, the king obviously appointed them to serve in his own court. They weren't uh, assigned to some border security or some deal on the outside of the king's court. They weren't assigned to go sweep up after the oxen and the sheep. They were assigned an important duty, really a place of honor to serve in the king's court. That was a high place of honor. And the Lord gave them that favor by blessing them with the wisdom, the strength, the understanding. You know, I want to encourage you, if you excel in your workplace, and I believe God wants us to succeed. He wants us to excel. But let's always remember that God is the one who gave us our minds, our bodies, our wisdom, our gifts, talents, and abilities. It all comes from the Lord. He is the creator. He created us. We're the creation. So if you ever receive praise, always turn it around and give it right back to the Lord and honor him, thank him, give him all the glory for he is worthy. So remember who you are. We are children of God. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We're serving him first and foremost. Remember to honor those in authority. Represent Jesus well. And let's shine in a dark place. I love it. Uh, Matthew 5, 16 says, So let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. 
So let's bring glory to God. And number three, remember to trust and obey the Lord, even when it's difficult, even when it's tough. But trust and obey him, and he will use you then in great, mighty, powerful ways. Just like he used Daniel and his friends in the king's court. And Daniel, by the way, he outlived several administrations. He served all the way into Cyrus. And Cyrus is the one who issued the decree for the exiles to return to their homeland so that they could inhabit the land. And then Darius, of course, followed on with that. And they were able to rebuild their wall, rebuild the temple. The Lord used Cyrus and Darius to allow the children of Israel to one day return to the nation of Israel, to their homeland. So God used these men, Daniel and others, in powerful ways. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we're so grateful that you have the master plan. You tell us in Isaiah 46, you know the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end, that your plan will stand. So you have a great master plan. Lord, we pray that we would fulfill our part in it, that as we serve you every day, dear Jesus, with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, keeping you first place in our life and serving you as Lord, that you would use us, we pray, O oh God, in wonderful, powerful ways. Use us to be your hands and your feet and your voice. Help us to shine. Help us to do good works. Help us to pray and to honor those in authority over us. We might disagree with their decisions, but you are the one who has allowed them to be in that place, a position of authority. So we pray that you would help us to, to serve well, Lord, and we pray that you would use us as you at times allow us to have place of authority. Let us lead well with wisdom, with love, with understanding. Lord, I pray that you would lead, guide, and direct all of us as your church. If there are needs, dear Jesus, please meet every need, physical, financial, spiritual, and emotional. Work on our lives, Lord. Supply every need fully and completely. And we give you the praise, honor, and glory. We thank you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name, we ask this in faith believing. We thank you that you're going to do it. Amen. So glad you chose to connect with us again. If you need anything, please let us know. As a church, we are here for you. And as your pastor, I am here for you and praying for you. We love you in the Lord. And we look forward to great days ahead. Let's keep pressing forward in the good things that God has for us. Yeah.